Hello, my name is Chris Oziofu Ero, and you're welcome to our podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about female genital mutilation, and I have a fantastic guest with me. Uh, you know, topics like this, you don't treat it alone, right? So I have a fantastic guest with me, and I'm going to reel out her bio, and believe you me, you're going to be impressed. Before I get to her name, I would say for sure that she's so notable in the work that she's been doing that she was recognized in the UK with the Office of the Order of the British Empire. Now, uh, she's the Chief Executive of Africa, that's a UK charity which she founded in 2001 to address child safeguarding and child trafficking issues in African diasporan communities. Now, she's also the Chair of the BME Anti-Slavery Network, which she founded in 2019. Now, she is a noted expert in safeguarding children and that brings us to what it is we're talking about today right that's that's why she's the perfect guest female genital mutilation and her name is debbie ario i mean it's so much more than this though i had to just save time <laughs> right and so that her hair doesn't smell too much <laughs> <laughs> but you're quite good at what you do and, and kudos for that and you know it takes it takes a lot to be passionate about things like this so what made you go into this venture in the first place let's start off Thank you. Well, thank you for having me on this yeah. program. Um, so I started the charity in 2001 yeah. in the UK. And the reason I started was simply because we have always seen a number of children from different African countries mm. coming to live in the UK. Mm. And then we're seeing cases of them being abused. Well, as abused in terms of the UK uh, laws on yeah. child protection. Yeah. Abused, harmed, even killed. Yeah. And when I say killed, there were definitely cases of children who are newly arrived and who were killed by people who were meant to be looking after them. Mm. And there was a particular case of a girl who was about eight years old, around 1990, 2000. And her case really shook the UK, mm. really shook the UK because she was brought by a family member and about three, four months afterwards, she was killed and my daughter was eight years old okay. then and it affected everybody but it affected me as well yeah. yeah and i thought well i mean i need your old child surely mm. and i wanted to do something to help yeah. and we're here today now with africa mm. which i set up in the aftermath of that mm -hmm. wow and you know it's it's interesting that you talk about because the UK is known for very stringent uh, laws on child protection. So it's very uncanny for us to find stories there about children being abused, being trafficked, and even being mutilated genitally. You know, so how do you think that is possible? How and why? Well, because when people travel wherever they go, they don't leave their culture behind. They don't leave the they don't leave their character behind. Mm. They don't leave their culture behind. They don't leave their tradition behind. Mm. They take everything with them. And so, if you're living in the UK, uh, in Nigeria, uh, where Nigeria, so if you're living in Nigeria, and you were brought up within a culture where children are silenced, yeah. children are beaten for everything they've done, they shouted at. If you migrate to the UK, you're not going to leave all that behind, because it's it's the way you were socialized, mm. right? So. That is still happening. So you're still going to be doing that, which unfortunately is against the laws of the land mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. And of course, you'll get into trouble mm -hmm. with the authorities. If you so the stories that. that you you got to hear of these cases, how did you come about them? Someone reported, or I, I, I I'm trying to get yeah we we because I'm sure these practices were done on the down low. Yeah, really. Yeah, because a child who will be uh, mutilated. Is, uh, so, I mean, the UK now people are very savvy. They know they can't do it in the UK. Mm. So a lot of the time, what happens is, children my is, you know, when is this long holiday? It's six weeks holiday. Mm. So that's when a lot of children are taken out mm. to their countries of origin, like Nigeria, Syria, or Somalia, mm. to have it done. And the child has it done. There's enough time to heal, enough, enough time for them to heal yeah. before being brought back to the UK. But the physical healing could have ha um, occurred, but the emotional healing, yeah, the, damage the damage is done. And of course, people know that something has happened to the child. So the child might disclose, the child might report, the child might say so to somebody in confidence, 
or somebody else might say, actually, I know about this particular child. This is what's happened to that child. So there are many ways that you know this this comes out, even though people try to suppress it, but definitely it does come out. Yeah. And I know it's a it's a cultural phenomenon, right? But for those who probably might not be aware, could we touch on that a bit? What is the cultural importance okay. of female genital mutilation? Why do cultures increase it? Okay. I think let me let me try and maybe kind of like explain so we have a common understanding of FGM. So yeah. female genital mutilation, in some countries they call it female cutting, in some countries they call it female circumcision. And there are different types. So there's type 1, uh, which is common in, I think, in Nigeria itself, in some parts of Nigeria, where it's just the removal of a little bit of the clitoris. Mm -hmm. And then type 2 is the removal of more yeah. of the clitoris. And, and maybe part of some other uh, organs around the clitoris. And then type 3 is, I mean, we see type 3 a lot in the UK. Wow. That is called infibulation. That is a total removal of the female genitalia. Everything is removed um, and sewn up with a little hole for urine, for menstruation, menstruation and for sex. Right, so we see that in the UK among certain communities. Mm -hmm. And and so um, in those communities, people will say to you, well, it's, it's what the, our religion says. So for them, it's a religious dictate. Mm -hmm. I, to be a good female of a particular religion, you must have it done. Mm -hmm. Although some people also say, actually, no, it's not part of Islam. Mm -hmm. it, there's nothing in the Quran that says that you must do female genital mutilation. So, there's that debate ongoing, but for some people, it's certainly a religious uh, matter. But for other people, it's a cultural matter. This is what we do in our family. This is what we do in our community. And it's I mean, tradition. it's tradition, so it has to be done. We see many instances of that in the UK as well. Mm. So culture and religion play a very, very big role uh, for many people. And for many people as well, it's not culture, it's not religion, it's just well, it's culture, but I mean, a twisted kind it's of. a twisted kind of culture. You know, you have to have it done because if you don't have it done, and uh, you, you know, you're having a baby, and if the baby said touches the clitoris, the baby will die, or you know, if a woman's clitoris is not cut, then she will be smelly. Uh, if you don't do it, nobody's going to marry you mm -hmm. in your community. So there are many, many. Excuses and I've like also that. heard um, one that I hear that's quite prevailing is the fact that if you have it done, it reduces your your urge Absolutely. to be, uh, yeah. I mean, to engage in Excellent. infidelity yeah. and you know stuff. Yeah, like so that. so so you have to be chaste as a woman, yeah. and so sex for you is very functional. It's for you to have children, mm. and you're not meant to enjoy sex. Mm. The, your clitoris enables you to enjoy sex, so that's why it's removed in some communities because then it means that you so you're becoming so addicted to having sex mm -hmm. that you're gonna be going out and having sex with other men. And when we tie that to what we know biologically, that is not true. Absolutely, <laughs> that but that's what true. some people uh, believe. So yeah. in order to curtail the sexual desires, mm -hmm. they just chop it off. And in fact. In terms of infibulation, type 3 FGM, mm. that is possibly, apart from the religious issue, this is also the main reason. The main reason. Yeah. And so we could safely say right now that female genital mutilation actually panders to Patrick. Absolutely. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, this mm. is all about what the man wants. Mm. And I can give you a scenario. I can give you a I can tell you a story. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. This yeah. is very interesting. So we were running a community program. Uh, in a part of London, it's been a while now, some years ago, yeah. with the Somali community. And, you know, it was men, because of course this happens because of men. Mm -hmm, yeah. whether, whether it's religion, whether it's culture, it's all to do with men. Mm -hmm. And so we had this session with all these uh, Somali men, and this man stood up. You need to, you need to have me your phone, I, wanna, I have to demonstrate it. Okay. So this man stands up, he says that female genital mutilation is like my mobile phone. If I don't want somebody to use it, I put a password on it. Oh, I get it now. Yeah. So for him, it's about that. Form Protecting of my property. My property. Oh dear. It's a password. Oh dear. Yeah. I I know the the thing is is this. Yeah, we've we've stated the fact that it panders to patriarchy, 
But then let's look at it from a very um, medical point of view now, uh, in terms of the aftermath. You know, for them, the cultural aftermath, the religious aftermath, or the patriarchal aftermath is we're protecting our property, we are preventing the ladies from being used. But the medical aftermath of it, what is the effect on the body? Oh, the, the consequences right from childhood. So in some communities, they do it when the baby's about eight days old. Yeah. The, the health consequences from that age mm. to old age. Mm. For the baby, the baby could bleed to death, the baby could die, the baby could contract tetanus and other uh, infections. From when they're a teenager, they could die as well. We know that. We also know that the, uh, the procedure can go wrong. Yeah. And we've had instances where a girl has been unable to have children later in life because the procedure had gone wrong. It tampered with it. They could, have, they could have contract HIV because in some communities they're using the same material to call different girls. So mm. in some communities, like Syria, Leon, for example, this is part of the uh, what do you call it, the uh, girl, girlhood to womanhood uh, the ritual, ritual. The coming of each. Thank you, okay. ritual. Yeah. So they take them into the bush or mass. Mm. They do different things with them, including FGM. So they call them or mass. They use the same material to call them. So the child could contact, not just tetanus, but serious illnesses like HIV, AIDS, and other things, right? Mm -hmm. They could die yeah. from the injury. So in the UK, we know that a lot of Somali women, uh, they, they have kidney problems. Mm -hmm. if, before I even go into that, a lot of Somali women cannot give birth naturally. They have to have a cesarean because, yeah, because, of the procedure. because it's a procedure that's been done to them. And of course, because of the procedure that's been done, infibulation, don't forget talking about infibulation where they remove everything and they sew it up. Mm -hmm. They only, they can remove the stitches on the night of the wedding. Of the wedding. And yeah. you know why, you understand know, why. Yeah. But as soon as that, as the, the marriage has been consummated. They stitch it back on. Yeah. Oh no. So, so sex is, so that's, that's that. And, and so for, for, some, for a child who had it done at the age of 12, of course, if you're urinating or you're passing blood, as, and it's a very, I mean, it's like a very small hole. Tiny hole, yeah. Tiny hole, like the tip of my little finger. It means that you're doing a lot of damage to your kidney. So by the time they're like in their 50s, in their 40s, they're having serious okay, now problems getting, with their kidney. I'm getting where the infection could come in. Because, yes. Um, I mean, you're menstruating, you're passing out clots and everything, and the hole is... Very extremely small. small. So you're retaining so all you're that. Retaining, your body. Oh Thank you. God. Yeah. And that's why the smell. Yeah. And the issue of incontinence. The issue of incontinence. I, I, I mean, I guess. So in the UK, mm -hmm. we have all these young girls who had it done, and then you know, it, it took a long time for many educational establishments to understand that the reason why the girls will go into the toilet and be there forever. It's not because they don't want to come back to class. It's simply because they're genuinely speaking trying to urinate. Right? So they're trying to urinate, it's not coming out, and then and then it's coming out in drips. Mm -hmm. and, and that really is that. Yeah. So, but the other thing I wanted to say, because, I mean, when you have a, a, somebody who's gone through all of this, mm -hmm. they, when they get to their 50s and 60s, they have serious problems with their kidneys, they're on dialysis. Hmm. Because it, the kidneys have been damaged hmm. by female genital mutilation, so a lot of women didn't re or they couldn't connect FGM hmm. with, to, that. with that until it was explained to them the reason why you have problems with your kidney is because of all this damage that's been done, right? From when you were 12 years old, when you had it done, to the age of 50, mm -hmm. you've suffered, but you will continue to suffer so till you die. It's amazing that so much work, thanks to people like you, so much work is being done in terms of enlightenment, in terms of exposure. But it's still amazing that you find people in this day and age, you know, with the increase in technology advancement and everything, people still practice it. I mean, the, I mean, just before we came on, we were talking about a Lagos monarch who recently ran away yeah. because his second child was about to be mutilated. Yeah. 
and he ran away because his first child was mutilated and died as a result of the tetanus Absolutely. that she contracted from yeah. the procedure. Yeah. So what what can be done? Because I, I would I would assume that we're doing so much already with all the programs, initiatives that we're doing. In fact, we've had several um, um, governors' wives, presidents' wives, you know, taking up this project. Yeah. But it's still there. It's still there. Culture is extremely difficult to eradicate, mm. especially if something that people hold very dear mm. to themselves, especially if it's linked to patriarchy. Mm. And in uh, countries like Mali and Guinea, they've started to do something which I think we should actually promote. They've started to do like a a symbolic FGM, right? Could so, you yeah, so. They take them into the bush, rather than cut them, they just celebrate them. They do everything else, but they don't actually do the cutting. cutting. Oh, okay. So, so the so they so they've done everything, and at, at the end of it, the woman, the girl who to womanhood aim has been achieved. Mm -hmm. So they're now women. Mm -hmm. They can now go and they're free to get married and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we need to start to see how we can have something similar, maybe in Nigeria, where. Uh, with the example of the monarch, yeah, it's it's really down to her, the child being the first granddaughter of the previous king, the first daughter of the king. Of the king. Is there something else we can do to celebrate the first daughter, the firstborn daughter in the family, without mutilating them? So we need to start to think outside the box in relation to how we can address this problem, mm -hmm. because the celebration, the I guess for them is to highlight the role of the, that particular um, position that the girl plays. Mm -hmm. So is there something else we can do to highlight the role without actually, you know, cutting them? Yeah. So we have to have start having conversations around that. around that. Not to say don't do it, but to say what else can we do that still highlights the importance of the role of the girl child mm -hmm. in the family. I'm talking about, um, I mean, we end, we end with this. I'm talking about corrective measures and disciplinary actions, you know. I, I mean, you're coming from the UK, the country where, as we said, you know, um, child protection rights is something they really hold on to tightly. When they do come into contact with people who have actually engaged in FGM, not the victims now, those who are the instigators, what do they do to them? Well, is it a crime? It's a criminal offense. Oh, yeah. we so have they the, go to jail or something? The well, um, the, it's not about finding. It's, it doesn't help the child if the parent goes to jail, mm -hmm. because then the child carries an additional burden in the community. Mm -hmm. And what is that burden? That is that child that sent his parent or, or her parents to prison. Mm -hmm. So we we'll recognize that we're not actually then helping the community. We're not helping the child. So you can't throw, excuse my language, throw the baby out with the water. Mm -hmm. We have to think creatively about how we can educate the parents and communities about not doing this because it is not in the best interest of the child. And so that's why even the authorities, they're not very keen on prosecution. Mm -hmm. So far, we've only had one prosecution, successful prosecution in the UK. And what was, what was that? Uh, it was uh, 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that you have with that is because those who are instigating actually don't believe it's a crime. They don't. For them, it's their family um, tradition. You know, yeah, we, we, we did some so research. That's, that's the challenge. Yeah, we did some research in Manchester about five years ago, and that's what exactly what they said. Mm. Some people even said, you know, if you think about, if you do a cost of benefit analysis, so mm. what is the cost of me not ensuring that this girl uh, has FGM. The mm. cause is that I'll become ostracized in my community. Mm. The, the, the cause is that my daughter will never get married. Mm. And the cause is that I'll be for, become the laughing stock of everybody. Mm. I would rather go to prison yeah. than allow that to happen. So people, people, I guess, you know, people are very willing to do that. Mm. So we have to think about where Outside people are coming from. Absolutely.
Thank you so much, Debbie. This has been an amazing chat. Thank you. Right? Thank you so much. And thank you too for joining us and you know just following the trend of the conversation. And I want to implore you that in your own little corner, in your own little space, we have people like Debbie who are doing the big thing. You know, that's their passion, that's what they're engaged in. But in your own little space and corner, you can do something, you know, for 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 your community. You get it, you know, because now we've seen that FGM is not just about the mutilation itself, it's far-reaching. And we, she highlighted on how a woman in her 50s can actually develop kidney issues and she'll be like that until she dies. So let's not just think about today, let's think about the woman's life, her future, and the future of her children as well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Your way when you're afraid he's your courage when you stumble he will steady you when you're hurt he's gonna heal you when you're broken